this week on World Stories. Hitler's living quarters, a glimpse of the past. No future, Iran's Afghan refugees. But first to Istanbul, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan calls it fighting terrorism, closing down newspapers and putting journalists behind bars. The heavy hand of censorship in Turkey. This is the studio where Voice of Life used to be broadcast from. The innocent-sounding show was shut down by Turkish state prosecutors. The program's former editor-in-chief can vividly remember the day in early October when the troubles began. On that day, our satellite transmission was suddenly stopped at about 8 o'clock in the middle of our broadcast, without any warning. It was the first day of our new talk show format. The guests had just taken their seats and the screens went black. Shortly afterwards, enforcement officers came to seal the doors. The charges against Kozar? Broadcasting terrorist propaganda. Dozens of other radio and television stations were closed down on the same day. Hundreds of employees suddenly found themselves out on the street. Many now fear the daily newspaper Jamhuriyet could also be closed. Protesters have been camped outside the newspaper's headquarters in Istanbul since 13 editorial staff were arrested. I came here because I would like to see my grandchildren grow up in a safe and democratic country. For that to happen, we need Jumhuriyet. Innocent people are being thrown into prison every day. We've had enough. And not just domestically. There have also been large protests abroad, but the government appears unfazed. Someone from the European Parliament said to me that we had crossed a red line by arresting these journalists. We say to you, my friend, that we are not interested in your red lines. Our people determine our red line. Critical journalists who haven't yet been arrested are seeking refuge on the internet. The former editor-in-chief at the Milliet newspaper, Dogan Atkin, has launched a new news site called T24. Some two million people visit the site every day. We reported on the government raising taxes on tobacco products. For that we got a fine of about 25,000 euros, because officially it was deemed to be illegal tobacco advertising. That's exactly the amount we need to pay rent and salaries for three months. The voice of life is no longer. The studio and offices remain locked up. Arif Koza is now considering if he should work for a publication run by the political opposition, as long as they remain open anyhow. Iran is home to some three million Afghans. Too many, says the Islamic Republic. But the EU is planning to boost its aid to Iran in an effort to reduce the numbers trying to reach Europe. They've been here for over 30 years now. Some 3,000 Afghan refugees live in the Batsir Chamran camp in the Iranian province of Kerman. Badin Golami is grateful to the Iranians for their help. But the widow doesn't see much of a future in Iran. Her children have to work dangerous jobs. Her son broke his leg doing so. I was 10 when I got here. My kids have never seen Afghanistan. We don't have the money to travel there and the security situation is so terrible that our relatives have now also fled to Iran. About one million Afghan refugees are registered in Iran. Many of them have lived here for decades. The situation is even more frustrating for an estimated two million undocumented refugees here who mostly work illegally on construction sites. But for about a year now, they've been able to send their children to school, partially in thanks to aid organizations and the EU. EU officials believe that if conditions for refugees in Iran improve, they'll be less likely to try to make the dangerous journey to Europe. But closer cooperation with Iran is essential. Christos Stylianidis, the EU Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid, is convinced that refugees would benefit greatly. Why not the Afghan refugees uh, 
stay very close to their home and uh, maybe in the next time, future time, when uh, we'll see uh, peace in their land uh, to make a repatriation process in order to uh, return in their homes. This is the best scenario. Stylianidis knows it's a long-term and ambitious project. A slump in global oil prices, along with growing Iranian public discontent about so many refugees in the country, is putting local authorities under pressure. It's very likely the EU would notice a difference if we did not support refugees here. Last year there was a wave of refugees heading into Europe, but without the efforts of the Islamic Republic it would have been even worse. Christos Stylianidis announced the EU would double funding for Iranian refugee aid to 12.5 million euro this year. But that still isn't enough, because many refugees here continue to dream of making the journey to Europe. Africa now, and a small village in the south of Senegal. Chimpanzees in the area have long been under threat. Their habitat eroded. Is it too late to reverse this trend? It's laundry day in Dinde Filo. Women have been washing clothes in the river for as long as they can remember. Especially in the dry season when the village wells dry up and water is scarce. So packaging and even old clothes are left in the forest. The community wants to change that and has declared Dinde Filo a conservation park. Karim Kamara has sensitized the village to the need to protect the environment. Twice a week, the women meet for a community cleaning action. Their aim, zero plastic, no more plastic waste in Din de Felou. Some 50 women join the initiative. Despite their efforts, the women have yet to reach their goal. Plastic is everywhere. That's what we are struggling against here. We want people to use textile bags we have expressly ordered. But compared to how it was, we've taken a big step forward. Liliana Pacheco Ricote is a Spanish scientist who has been living in Dindefilo for the past seven years, researching the habitat and behavioral patterns of the chimpanzees in the conservation park. She commends the work Karim Camara has been doing. <laughs> Every morning at 6 o'clock, Ricote sends rangers into the forest. They're looking for a pack of about 50 chimpanzees that have withdrawn because of the baboons. The rangers crisscross the forest the whole day without glimpsing a single chimpanzee. We wanted to do something for the apes, but we didn't know how. The Spanish researchers helped us. We talked with all the neighboring villages explaining what this was about. People accepted it, and we were able to found a conservation park with the other communities. The hopes are that the chimpanzees will bring in tourists. The villagers are trying to protect the habitat of the endangered species as best they can. But the park will only be financially viable if the chimpanzees remain. Last report takes us to Berlin, where a private museum has created a replica of Adolf Hitler's bunker. It's not without its critics, but the curators say it's about providing information. A replica of where the Nazi regime came to an end, the underground bunker where Adolf Hitler committed suicide on April 30th, 1945. The war he had started still raged on the streets above. Once the Soviets occupied Berlin, Hitler's bunker faded from history and was later destroyed. Now a new exhibition is offering insights into the Führer's last days with a replica of the dictator's living quarters. We're trying to demystify Hitler, debunk his legend after 70 years and present the facts. What remains is an insidious dictator who shot himself in a basement once it became clear that his enemies had beaten him. 
Hitler spent two whole months living in the shelter behind his chancellery in Berlin, along with his girlfriend, Eva Braun. As seen in the German movie Downfall, the dictator's entourage still lived in surreal luxury. Meanwhile, the German capital was being reduced to ruins. Troops and civilians followed orders to keep fighting, many losing their lives in the process. The real location of Hitler's actual bunker is easy to miss. Visitors from around the world still flock to it, some with no clear idea of what happened here. It's the Führer bunker, right? That's all I know. I find everything about this period very, very interesting. About Hitler? Yeah. Hitler played a key role in Berlin's history, that's why we want to see it. The new exhibition, called Documentation Führerbunker, opened in an air raid shelter still standing from World War II. Visitors get a glimpse of Hitler's final days, but they also find out how ordinary people survived in overcrowded shelters at the end of the war. A key exhibit is this model of Hitler's bunker. Its designers chose not to use Nazi symbols to avoid creating a pilgrimage site for right-wing extremists. Neo-Nazis don't want to see how Hitler shot himself in his bunker or hear me saying neo-Nazis are idiots. They wouldn't enjoy our tours at all. But Enno Lenzer and his team did choose to use the term Führerbunker. Not to capitalize on Hitler tourism, they say, but to educate people about the horrors of the Third Reich.